Hello, and welcome to A Fistful of Dice. This is going to be another episode of Memoirs of a Dungeon Master. I know I've been doing a lot of these lately, but uh, I moved recently, and so I have yet to really get my setup uh, back to where I want it to be. And in addition to that, I'm completely surrounded by boxes, <laughs> and that's not really the best backdrop for videos. So for now, this is what you're getting. I want to talk today about Brook. Last time I talked about the character of the Corruptor, um, the antagonist in my Provokers game. Today I'm going to talk about the Corruptor's first victim, and that is the town of Brook. Brook is a village, uh, a little town in my homebrew setting of Aranoth. More specifically, it's located in the region known as the Western Southlands. And the main government in the Western Southlands is this thing called the Freehold, uh, the Freehold of Gwyn Tarad. And Brook is a small part of that Freehold of Gwyn Tarad. It's a farming village. It's populated by simple folk like hill dwarves, stout halflings, humans, half-elves, people who work the earth, who know the land, people who enjoy a simpler, more rustic lifestyle. It's a very tight-knit, very friendly, warm, and welcoming community. It's been an interesting experience recently because I just finished uh, a supplement, an RPG supplement, about Brook. And you can actually go download that supplement today, uh, right now, at AbsoluteTabletop.com. You can go pick it up. And the reason why it's an interesting experience is because I retroactively created Brook. Brook has always been a town, but I haven't really thought about what was in that town, who lived in that town, where that town came from, what were its origins, things like that. The inspiration for Brook came from a few different sources, but the main source is probably where I live, Washington State. And in Washington, there are lots of pockets of sort of rural agriculture, little farms here and there. Nothing expansive, you know, but occasionally you'll come around the corner and you'll see a little farm. There'll be cows and goats and, you know, a small field, a garden. And I always love that about this area because, you know, the soil and the rainfall kind of lend themselves to that style of little farm. In addition, if you if you go over the pass and you go over to eastern Washington and you head towards, you know, Spokane and Ellensburg, you start to see these big fields, these rolling hills that extend beyond the horizon, these, you know, pastoral sort of images that have always stuck with me. And when I imagine Brook and the surrounding area, that's what I see, are these rolling hills, these pastures, these fields that just go on as far as the eye can see. And in the middle of it, just this little cluster of buildings, these structures of stone and wood. There's nothing fancy about them, but they're home. In addition to that, you know, Brook obviously has echoes of the Shire, of Hobbiton, uh, from The Lord of the Rings. You know, the, the simple, rustic, sort of tucked away place where there isn't a lot of excitement. But the people prefer it that way. And much like the Shire is put into danger by what occurs in Middle-earth with the rise of Sauron and the re-emergence of the One Ring and things like that, Brook is put into danger with the rise of the Corruptor and the war for the Western Southlands. Now, the reason why I'm talking about Brook is because when I created Brook, when I named Brook, it was for this one-shot 
um, it was for the Provokers. Now, they weren't called the Provokers at that time. It was just a group of guys that I was gathering to play 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, and it turned into the Provokers. <laughs> but when I created Booker, I wasn't thinking... Th- I wasn't thinking long term. I wasn't thinking what is Brooke going to look like in five sessions, in six sessions, in ten sessions. I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking I need a catalyst for these heroes. I need I need kindling to start this flame, so to speak. And so Brooke was created and it was an ad hoc town. It was created so that I could then destroy it. Brooke, I I just wantonly destroyed Brook without taking the time to learn about it. I knew that it was a farming town. I knew the vague population makeup. But other than that, I really didn't know a whole lot about it. But I put it to the torch. (laughs) And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Obviously, you don't need to flesh everything out in your game world. You don't need to think about the minutia of something just to be able to do it. But it's funny looking back that I I almost feel bad about that because in writing this supplement, I have fallen in love with this place with Brooke, but much like that who song pictures of Lily, where the kid falls in love with a woman in a picture who turns out to be dead. I have fallen in love with a town that I have already destroyed, which is interesting. I think. So yeah, I I destroyed Brooke in the first session of the Provokers. It was destroyed off screen, so to speak. The Provokers are in this tavern, the Wayward Wanderer, and a bunch of broken and battered refugees come stumbling in and say that their village of Brooke has been destroyed. And the Provokers journey to the ruins of Brooke, and they see the devastation, and they retrieve a relic from the temple there, and then they leave. When I decided that I wanted to do an RPG supplement about Brooke, I was really starting just with that much information. It was a blank canvas. It was it was a a location that was important to the overall story arc of that campaign. But other than the fact that it used to exist and now it doesn't, I didn't know anything about it. And so I was really starting from square one. And so I went through the process of working backwards. I looked at ruins. I looked at this blasted, barren landscape, this place that had been ransacked and burned and pillaged by barbarians at the behest of this being known only as the Corrupter. I started with this place these skeletal remains. And I worked backwards from there. I started putting flesh on the bones. And it was an interesting experience for me to do that because I've never intentionally done that. I started thinking about who lived in Brook other than those few dozen survivors that the Provokers met. I started thinking about why were they there Where did they come from? When was the town founded and by whom? What sort of locations could you find in Brook? Was there a tavern? Was there an inn? What did the people of Brook do for fun? How did they defend themselves? And why couldn't they defend themselves against this horde of barbarians that, you know, overran them? And I started writing. And the town of Brook was created before me. I started thinking about these seven families that had survived this catastrophic event known as the Great Scorching, a time when dragons ruled and their fires, their breath, reshaped Aranoth and set in motion a new age <clears throat> these people, these peasants, these former slaves, these people who had 
survived this great scorching. They're the people who founded these towns and villages. They're the people who laid the foundations. They're the people who persevered against extreme adversity and just deadly perils to create these little points of light, these pockets of civilization, these, you know, candles sort of flickering in the darkness. And so I came up with the idea of seven families, seven different groups of people who came together, all from different backgrounds, but all driven by a need to forge a new path, create a new community, make their own way, survive together. And they created something really cool in Brook, a place that as I was writing it, I thought, man, I wouldn't mind living here. Brook sounds great. I came up with the idea of a naming stone, a big river boulder that the people of Brook wrote new names on. They created new names for themselves, which is the surest way to leave your past behind. The surest way to forge a new path is to create a new identity for yourself. And these names are simple. They're farming, you know, farming words, words of agriculture, loam, till, uh, you know, Brahman, Anther, Morgan, just really simple surnames. But each family had a different focus, a different purpose in Brook, a different kind of uh, skill set that all sort of worked together in this wonderful rustic synergy. And from there, I decided that, yeah, there was a tavern. And it was owned by halflings, and they created this stuff called Barrow Stout. But you can't get it anymore, because it all burned. There's no Barrow Stout left. And I decided that there was a forge called the Boulder Forge that was constructed of river rocks and owned by dwarves who used to serve in the slave legions of this great human empire that toppled. But they're not there anymore. The, the forges have grown cold. And I, I talk about this temple, this great temple to the, agri the goddess of agriculture, Gephion. But it's empty now. It's, it's barbarians have taken up residence within its walls. And I talk about the river and the fields, and I talk about the layout of this town, the structure of its leadership, the different people that have come from this town. And I did all of this knowing that all of it was gone, all of it was burned away. But my point in all of this is that that doesn't lessen the impact of those people, of that place, of the things that were there. Just because they're gone doesn't mean that they didn't matter at one time. It doesn't mean that they won't matter again to someone somewhere. As I was writing this supplement, I realized that I was pulling for the refugees of Brook like I never had before as a game master. You know, these convenient plot devices had become real people. They had become people with real loss and tragedy. People who had come from, you know, a great disaster. And so the sacking of Brook went from being the catalyst of the plot, the, the hook for the adventure, and it became a tragedy. It became real for me like it never had before and so it retroactively became more important to me it retroactively affected me and i hope that that comes through in the supplement the idea of losing home the idea of your your place being taken away from you
your purpose being taken away from you for seemingly no reason. I thought about how you can do this with other things in RPGs. Like, take for example a villain. Maybe you have an antagonist in your campaign. And you don't necessarily think everything through at the outset. Like we do. But you have a simple idea in mind. You have simple motivations. You have a simple method. A simple goal that this villain has in mind. Maybe you have a villain whose goal is to usurp a king. Take over a kingdom. Topple a throne. Right? But as the sessions roll on and you grow more and more attached to this character and you learn more and more about them and you start developing the whys and the hows and the wins and you start thinking about why does this villain want to topple the king? And you start thinking, well, maybe the king wronged him. And then you start thinking, well, maybe the king and him used to be friends. And then you start thinking, maybe they're related. Maybe they served in, the, in a war together. And this character starts becoming more and more real to you. But it's not like you're going back and changing something. It's not like you're going back and saying, oh, well, we're going to retcon this because I want this villain to be this way instead. You know... Uh, Tim and James from Tabletop Terrors, they talk a lot about broad strokes, painting with broad strokes. That's really what you want to do with these things, with with characters, with locations, with anything that you're creating for your homebrew world or for any RPG campaign that you're running. You want to paint with the broad strokes before you bring out that brush, that, that fine brush for doing the details. You ever see Bob Ross on TV, The Joy of Painting? The dude lays down broad strokes first. He paints these really vague shapes. He puts down color, you know, shadow. <laughs> he puts down the backdrop. And at first, it doesn't look like anything. He says, oh, I'm going to put down these mountains. And you say, those don't really look like mountains. But then a few minutes later... After he's brought out his his palette, you know, his uh, his little uh, knife, his paint knife, and his fine brushes, and he starts putting in the details, and the mountains become clear. They become in focus all of a sudden. That's how it is with with anything, but specifically, that's how it is with RPGs. You put down those those broad strokes, those vague shapes, those backdrops, those colors. You put those down, and then you start laying over the top of them. You start chiseling away at the, at the excess. You start putting in light and shadow. You start painting over the top of them. You put a happy little tree down. You put a shack down by the river. You put bushes down, and all of a sudden you have this beautiful landscape. It's the same way with RPGs. So when I say that I feel bad about destroying Brooke, when I say that I feel guilty about <laughs> creating it just so I could destroy it, I don't feel bad because I think that that's not how I should have done it. I feel bad because I came to love this place later on. So don't be afraid to go into a campaign or a session with a big idea. And then as the sessions roll on, as the minutes tick by, as your players and you collaborate and create together, you can chisel away the excess and you can put in those fine details and you can bring out those detail brushes and you can fill in the gaps, fill in the blanks and make something real and tangible out of those big splotches of paint. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Memoirs of a Dungeon Master. I hope it gave you something to think about. It's definitely something that has given me something to ruminate on. And I hope that you go check out the Brooks Supplement at AbsoluteTabletop.com. 
it's available now, and I'm I'm really proud of it. Anyway, guys, it's going to be it for me. Take care, and happy gaming all.